and our fungus side and other crop management costs have gone up. But at the same time, our profitability has as well because all of a sudden, you know, we don't have those large, poor performing areas that we're still getting applications put over them that were being highly inefficient and, you know, wasteful in a way. Um, we're being a lot more efficient with capturing every application that we are putting on and through available rate especially, we're able to better utilise, you know, which soil types get how much nutrition to then be able to maximise our yield, which then obviously helps with our profitability. So, yeah, profitability definitely has been going up. And, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to the end of the large amelioration program because, uh, you, yeah, right, it is a, a very costly um process to do so it's good to finally sort of get to the end of it and now it's just working out the next steps to keep um, improving yep uh so for our yeah amelioration we you utilize EM and gamma data mainly to work out our depth to clay. Um, and then from that, depending on the depth uh, of the sand over clay um, duplex soil, um, it depends on the different operations. So on a deeper sand, we um, over 500 mil where we can't drag it from underneath, that's where we'll use yeah clay spreading as the operation, uh, carry greater buckets to grab it from a shallower area um, and spread it on the deeper areas. Whereas where we can drag it up from underneath, um, yeah, we're using those maps to to work those areas out. I've got another question. Um, I like with variable rate, do you do anything differently for the barley that you give to Nigel rather than the stuff that you send to? And looking from sustainability. It's... Yeah. Um, yeah, very topical at the moment. Um, yeah, wanting to yeah, work some more stuff out with the brewery to try and maybe do something similar to what CBH has been trying to achieve with carbon neutral um, beer, oh, sorry, barley, which then obviously turns into beer. Um, but at the moment, yeah, we use the protein meters. It, originally, the protein meters were used to pick out the best or that that specific quality of grain that they need for the malt. Um, so, yeah, the brewery did get the best of our crop. But as we've got better with our nitrogen management, you know, we're getting a, a bigger set to, to pick from, I guess. So, yeah, it, it's the whole system. And I think the whole brewery story is the ultimate reflection of what we want to achieve and growing sustainably, growing grain and you know, at high quality. Cool. Fantastic. And I'm sure we can discuss it more over a beer tonight. So uh, thanks very much, Brad. Okay, we move on to our next uh, industry news segment. Um, we've got, uh, we have Mark Armstrong from Hardy Australia. Mark is the business development manager for sustainable and precision agriculture. Thanks, Mark. Okay, first and foremost, uh, thank you to SPA um, for this invitation to be a part of the symposium. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit of bit myth busting hopefully about GeoSelect and selective spraying. So as mentioned, good day, that's me. That's what I am. I'm here with my colleague, Scott Watson, who's the territory manager for Western Australia. So selective spraying, why? Obviously ongoing uh, high input costs now, significant cost to growers, whether it be obviously the cost of herbicides or machine competition. You know, the ability to maximize the efficient use of more effective herbicides. With traditional broadcasts or blanket spraying, obviously the disadvantages are takes out yield, takes out moisture, and takes out nutrients from the soil. It works. Um, obviously, uh, selective spraying, irrespective of which brand, which OEM you use, improves soil health. Obviously, you know, some chemicals are in fact residual chemicals which can still have effect up to 12 months further down the line. And every time a chemical is applied to a, applied to a crop, uh, basically you can knock the other side effects is you can knock a crop back by, by up to 10%, which obviously has an impact on the following year. So when we come to GeoSelect, why? Um, different approach in, in the technology. Um, it's a total different way of thinking, but it's the most obviously targeted approach to weed seeking. Uh, spot selective spraying to date. 
I'm not being biased, by the way. Uh, captured all, it's all done through aerial imagery. And you'll see in the next couple of slides it's, um, how we do that anyway. But the main benefit for us is that it's um, once you've got the data, you can calculate what's being captured before you even start to spray. So through the weed management one the other knows exactly what strength the batch needs to be, which rows can be skipped, increase, decrease speed, and also the best results in the efficiency from the spraying application. Targeted approach, um, there's only the chemical savings up to 90%, but also reduced machine uh, running costs and reduced operator hours. I can, obviously, we can go into a little bit more depth about that, but basically because you know what you're spraying or you know what the infestation rate is of the paddock, you've got reduced uh, compaction on the soil, you're using less water, using less chemical. And obviously, as mentioned there, because of you know exactly where you're going to be in the paddock, reduce operator hours. So we don't use uh, prescription mapping. We don't use um, shape files. So you see on the top image there, what we've got is a prescription map as opposed to the geo select in the bottom half, run through the, sim the same simulator. So in the green, you see the spray targets and you in the blue is the overspray. As you can see straight away, there's you know, up to a five, uh, five times less chemical usage using the geo select. So why geo select? So engineered automatically adjust for um, boom height, boom deflection, boom width, uh, and obviously um, ambient conditions as well and more accurate spraying applications. So at the end of a complete spraying task application, the process is backed up by uh, record of placement through GPS, position and time date stamp for all, all the metrics are there. So basically how GeoSelect works is it will spray forward, but it will not spray back because it's already captured that data because every, every weed is geolocated. It won't spray back unless you override the system. Obviously, a bit of a blur, but obviously, H Select triple tier systems we have, it allows us to simultaneously um, broadcast and selective spray. Should obviously you wish to go down this way. So, effectively, what we do is we just turn one nozzle into selective spray and we'll turn, turn the other nozzle on nozzles into broadcasting spraying. But obviously, the main thing is, especially with uh, optical systems, if cameras or sensors can't see it, then they won't spray it. That's as simple simple as it, as it gets for us because obviously we, we look straight down. Uh, we have more chance of identifying the weeds in the paddocks. So how do we do it? So um, this is the, the sort of, the, we tried to myth bust here, all right, processing and capturing data. So we can use up to three different methods. Obviously we can use uh, UAVs or drones for basically 5,000 hectares and below. Fixed wing, uh, greater than 5,000 hectares, and satellite. So we're speaking with a company uh, in the States, so um, somebody maybe Albedo. So hopefully probably about 2030, we should be around about um, seven to eight centimeter resolution from the, from the satellite. Um, but in the short term, I've been doing this role now with the drones. Originally, we were only capturing around about sort of 400 hectares a day, then processing that. We're now up to 800, 900 hectares a day scanning. That effectively means once that's processed, you're spraying 800, 900 hectares the following day. That's a huge game changer for us, obviously, because the technology is getting better, the aircraft's getting better, and it's becoming more efficient. So how do we do it? So basically, following a rain event, this is where the, the, the mythology changes and your, your approach changes. All right, so roughly seven to 10 days after a rain event, um, grow a farmer or a pilot will come along, we'll scan the paddock. Once that information is collected, you can see in the next couple of slides how it's done. Basically, you've got decisions to make, funnily enough, as a, as a grower and a farmer, that's very rare. But it's this is where the game changer for us, we believe, is, is beneficial. So this is, we, what, this is one from Viridis Ag that we did at the beginning of the year. So this is how we do it. So we produce a KML, which is basically the boundaries of um, the paddock. So once we've got the KMLs, the pilots will put that into a flight plan. And what we'll do is slowly start to take images. So as you can see on this one here, this is just one image, but you can bring that across. There's actually three images. So we do that and we map the whole paddock. Once the whole paddock's been mapped and stitched together, what we do then is we put it through our proprietary software, which we call a Dynamap. And it starts to produce this. 
So what you can see here is um, regrowth in canola. So this is, once again, this is the same uh, paddock from Viridis Ag. So once that's fed into the machine, the benefits of is that you've got, as I went about earlier, you've got a choice, all right, with GeoSelect is the fact is, yes, you know what the infestation percentage is of the, of the weeds in the paddock, but do you spray or do you have to spray? If you do have to spray, then you've got the choice of your, your choice of herbicides or, you know, a, a certain blend or a cocktail mix that you want to, you, you need to mix depending on your, what type of infestation you've got. So from there, really, you obviously you'll mix only what you need. So for instance, you, you've got a 7,000 liter tank. You might only need 1,000, 1,500 liters. So you're saving chemicals, saving water. But once again, because you, you've got the reduced weight on the machine, less compaction on the soil. Quite an intuitive system. Once you're on the road, basically, it'll, it'll allow you to, um, as, as you approach sort of a, a weed patch or something like that, what you'll do, you'll get an advice notice on the screen. It'll say, slow down. You know, you, you've got a bigger, got a bigger sort of, so you get a more concentrated hit, and then you can speed up. One of the benefits of GeoSelect is what we think is incredible is the topographical data. So this is the same paddock, but obviously put into 3D mapping. But first of all, you start to see that it gives us elevation. It gives us, and obviously from that, we can derive the soil types. But not just that, we can actually then overlay it with water runoffs, which is absolutely key for identifying certain, uh, if you've got problem areas, you've got, you know, seed banks, you've got, um, you know, you don't know where after a rain event, why you've got constant problems. So with this, we can identify that. So we can then change, once again, our approach is how do we spray? Do we change our spray program? Do we start going for a pre-emergent spray or do we go for like double knockdown? But we can layer that very, very quickly so we can start to see if you've changed your spray program, um, basically what we get from it. Obviously, a little bit of a differences between um, what you call coupled, decoupled. GeoSelect is decoupled. There's no sensors on the, on the, on the boom. Uh, where coupled is sensors, optical, whatever. All right, just a quick overview of what the differences between the two. Main one for us, um, because we don't have to calibrate the system, we can lower the boom. So we can semi-mitigate spray drift. We can't eliminate it, but we can mitigate some of it. Uh, okay, user position nozzle, not position the sprayer, scalable maps, variable boom heights to reduce spray drift. Uh, software platform is you can actually take the screen out the, out the actual cab, walk along the boom, activate your sensors, activate your nozzles, just as a, a bit of a confidence check. And it's all real time. If um, partner there, if he was to move that boom now, he'd see it straight away in his um, in his user interface. Okay, this is done with Persa very quickly. So A and B were purely blanket spray. C was selective spraying. So this was done in March last year over in uh, South Australia. We've just enhanced it a little bit too, so either that you would never see the weeds. Okay, and basically this is the, what you get from the savings. So this is what's absolutely key. Even though we only did a, a short trial on that particular paddock, uh, the savings, the chemical savings were over 66%, as opposed to what we thought we were originally going to get. Um, so just goes to show, especially when you look at the water saved as well, you know, nearly 7,000 litres of water. And this is on, on the York Peninsula where water's pretty, pretty scarce, really. Obviously, estimated chemical saving there, we thought it was just be about 54%. And obviously, we had nearly 66% savings. With well, the cost saving there of nearly $2,000. Quickly available on the machine platforms, all SPs. We do the top end trailers. Good enough. Fantastic. Any Thanks, questions? Mark. Um, one quick question. And otherwise, Mark, you'll be around. Yeah, Scott and I will be here, obviously, for the next day and a half. So, yeah, please hit us up as much as you can. Thrashes within an inch of our lives, but yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if the only difference is if you use a spray drone, is the capacity of the tank. Then you sort you, you and obviously Scotty is more aware of it than mine because he worked with Hummingbird. But the fact is, you change categories. The bigger the spray tank you get on the spray drone, your license category changes. So you start to really, really sort of, you get into the fat with CASA. But you don't have, you know, and one of the things we are looking at, though, if um, for spray drones, that we can put the GeoSelect map into spray drones, so you're still going to get the same effect. 
So if there's certain areas where you can't get a, a boom, you can put a spray drone. So we're, we're trying to bring that software across so you get the best of both worlds. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you to Mark. Uh, our next presenter is Tom Longmire from Tom, if I get this wrong, uh, Kurong Pastoral Company. Um, Tom's been building an innovative PA program on the 5,700 hectare family farm at Beaumont. Um, Longmires are at the forefront in Australia of testing and integrating PA technology to improve the efficiency and profitability of the farm. Um, so Tom's going to talk today about integrating PA tools at a local farming operation level. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, thanks for SPA for having us along. And I uh, would also like to say congrats to all the presenters today. It's been a pretty interesting day. So, uh, yeah, to give a bit of a rundown, uh, we're at the Red Star, about 110 k's northeast of Esperance, or half an hour east of the Capit Cappuccino Street where Brad's from. So... Um, yeah, we've got about a 400 mil rainfall uh, and, yeah, sort of some of the bits with PA and, and control traffic that we're doing. And in the last sort of half a year, we've taken on a swarm bot and we've got a pretty keen interest in our business with Precision Ag. Uh, so from our sort of business, I'd say mapping's the key pillar to it all. And I guess it provides a very uh, solid base. Um, we use Aiden quite well or like he works in well with our business and um and these are sort of the six pillars i guess um of streamlines that we have within pa but it all relates back to mapping and uh it's why it's so critical so from our boundary mapping i guess that's sort of the the key to it all uh we've done four full rounds of our farm now uh in the ute uh so it sort of came about um, in 2009, dad went to a, a tour to South Australia and could see ryegrass from the fence line, like resistant ryegrass being spread in 12 metres from the header. Uh, so we, we, uh, I was doing a drink, sorry. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, found a slasher that was 1.3 metres wide. And uh, set our distance off that for all our external boundaries, and then that allows us to slide, like in the photo, uh, down and take out one to one to two rows of our wheat. Um, that also, we're about to start mowing, so normally early September, uh, and that gives us a longer spraying window for our resistant ryegrass, or to try and manage our ryegrass, but also stops uh, picking anything up from the fence line. Uh, for some advice, if you're about to map your farm, is put the receiver over the back axle uh, when you're boundary steering in a sprayer at 30 k's. Uh, the smooth corners are quite nice, and the further it is to the front, the sharper the hook with the corner. And we're now internal boundary steering with John Deere. Uh, our internal lakes are pretty similar country to uh, what Brad had in his slides, so it's uh on that theory too of not picking up any grass from the edge of the lakes and throwing that in from those boundaries. Uh, one of the, I guess, examples that we've been doing with variable rate is our seeding and using AM data. Uh, on Dad's Nuff Field in 2004, he came across a farmer in Manitoba that was uh, increasing his seeding rate by 15% and reducing his fertilizer rate on his salt. Uh, so, we've sort of adopted that theory um, and the darker blue is sort of our gray sodic clay and our red is our nice red loam in this. Uh, and it correlates quite well between the two soil types. Uh, so I guess the zone size you'll see is quite large. Um, that's the machinery capability we've got. Air seeders don't like changing rates very quickly. Um, and the sort of smaller pockets we're targeting with vertebrate gypsum and spreading and and using that when implements can adjust rates quickly and maintain that level of uh, capability. Uh, so one of, I guess, looking at the whole uh, PA on farm is uh, our internal boundary management and, and sort of our salt 
management. So um, we've got a lot of lakes and and sort of salt scolds throughout our place. Uh, and we've worked, we've cut a lot of drains and, and, and trying to move water flow to maintain where our salt is. Uh, in the red circle, we actually cut evap drains and used the soil from the drain and lined them up with our 36 metre high traffic tram lines so we can drive through the salt scolds. Uh, with the boundary mapping, all our sprays and spreaders have individual nozzle control. So we can sort of just drive across and it turns the nozzles off and turns back on. Uh, that's also to look after the, the sand fire and grass that we're trying to get growing on these salt skulls to stop it spreading too. Uh, so that's all the tech sort of coming in and and where that blue line is, we've plumbed the, the EVAP drains into the next lake to try get uh, utilise the surface area of that lake to actually drain because um, in our wet years, those smaller hollows were overfilling and ended up waterlogging. So a, a follow on from that, I guess, uh, our salt within our paddock that aren't permanent boundaries. Uh, we've started summer cropping now for the last sort of five years. Uh, so anywhere that waterlogs was potentially salty, uh, we're going in with a tillage radish and shiroi millet mix. Um, the tillage radish is quite salt tolerant in its germination. And uh, you sort of have to wait for that flushing rain to get the millet to grow. And then once that sort of germinates, that's what uses the water up. Uh, one thing we have found by putting tillage radish in these areas too, when they're laying under water all year, they're actually quite tight and compact. So some of our tillage radish is sort of growing down a good foot. So it's actually cracking it open and, um, yeah, we're seeing really good results. So we've hooked up the John Shearer combine with an electric clutch and into the uh, mapping of while we're planting it. Um, and then we're bringing those coverage maps of our cedar into our sprayer so the nozzles just turn on and off, not to make any more work while spraying in summer. So that bottom photo of the canola is in the middle of that hollow. Uh, so that was waterlogged. Uh, wheat in 2017 and where that red circle is we left that out and that didn't uh, germinate any canola it waterlogged again so that's sort of two years without any uh, production so we we use our canola and fuel peas as our it's they're the most sensitive to salt we find so we sort of really track those yield maps and make sure uh, so f I guess the follow-on from this area and the last couple of years we've been doing it is all these hollows are where our sheep, when we had sheep, they used to camp and the sand's blown up the side of the hill and made the edges of the hill or the edge of the hollow non-wetting. So we've, with a contractor, pulled them back into the bottom of the hollow and then uh, our clay's on the top of the ridge. So we've skimmed the top of the ridge, pulled the five to 800 mil of clay Clay spread it and put the sand back on top. And so we haven't lost any productive area, but some of these hollows now have filled up probably one and a half to two metres worth of sand. So we've also got rid of the water logging in these, or just given us more soil uh, water holding capacity in these hollows. And that also flows through into the system. Like in that top photo uh, at the bottom right corner there, we're looking at cutting an EVAP drain and hopefully with the clay spreading, we can actually release the amount of water getting through the system and pushing down the valley because we're actually using it up. Uh, and another, I guess, uh, an another strategy or trying to uh, work in with our production is an intra-farm weather network. Uh, we're trying to get accurate uh, rain and temperature data across the farm to work out our production potential and how we can maximize our intra-farm production. So that map is the annual rainfall till Friday. Uh, and as you can see, the variation between the farms is more than what we thought it would be um, for this year and trying to utilize that data uh, for our fertilizing strategies on our variable rate N and, and 
our sort of our second top up, knowing what we can push. We've got three or four soil probes uh, across different soil types too. And we've worked in with our immediate neighbours around it, trying to build a, a weather network that captures so we can see the rain coming through and pass. But I think apart from our immediate neighbours, if the network gets too big, you lose the ability to control the rainfall data. Um, we've had to put two rain buckets side by side a metre apart because we couldn't get reliable data. And once once you miss a rain, you can't just sort of backfill it, I guess, because you don't really know what was there. So um, since we've gone for that in the last two years, we're actually being able to trust this rain data. Um, but, yeah, looking forward to seeing what we can do with it and and understanding a bit more about how our soil types are reacting with the, with that rain and what potential that gives us. Yeah. Uh, so, and this is sort of a bit of a an overview of what we've um, recently taken on. Uh, so yeah, February we got a swarm bot with a haze boom with uh, a three thousand litre tank. Um, we first went and looked at them in twenty sixteen on a tour with Aiden and um, and a few other people and and tried to see where they were going and and in the last sort of couple of years they've really. Uh, got to that 12 and 18 metre width and now they're out to 24, which um, is good to see. Um, we reckon it's, or I think it's averaging about 10 to 12 hectares an hour. Uh, it turns around at three kilometres an hour. So in a lot of our lakey country, it, it pulls that work rate back. Uh, mapping has really been uh, critical for the swarm bot. They rely on a... Uh, a 1.5 metre distance from your fence as a geo fence, and that's a bit of a buffer. So because we'd map so accurately to 1.3, I could just sort of buffer the boundaries by 200 mil in their software instead of having to re-go re around it all again. Um, and so this is just a copy of one of the path plans that their website puts together. Uh, and, yeah, all our farms mapped with John Deere RTK. So... We could utilize the John Deere receivers that we were using in the base station to where it was mapped. Uh, the next sort of path in this progression is getting our roads mapped and fill points. Uh, you can set a queue for to once it finishes a paddock, it'll drive itself down the road to the next paddock and keep going. Uh, so getting that part of it all system fully working is sort of the next goal and, and hoping that this year um, our biggest downfall in our moisture management was at harvest. We get a lot of coastal rain and a weed germination normally through harvest and we don't have the labour availability to stay on top of that spraying. So the plan is, is once that first paddock canola is off, we, uh, the swarm bot's following our headers around and by the time we finish harvest, we've done the first round of spraying uh, some of the issues that we've come across as because um, we've got a lot of internal obstacles compared to northern New South Wales um, some of the things like second laps of internal boundaries and, and stuff that they sort of don't really have issues with uh, we've found out uh, we utilize, we're about to utilise a software contractor to actually hand draw a second lap until they can get their software uh, working with that. Uh, their obstacle detection is is good. It's very sensitive, um, probably more sensitive than I was expecting. Uh, but a lot of trees that are overhanging fence lines at two and a half to three metres off the ground, they're actually picking up. So we have to have a pretty big summer actually just cutting off branches and making sure that there's nothing in that sort of three metres and under overhanging. Um, and, yeah, they're still building their system and, and that's sort of been good to work with them because they're, they're pretty open for feedback and and their support um, is second to none. They can call them anywhere between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. They've sort of got after hours and, and phone support so and they can – all their 
they can log in, they can drive your robot off the computer. So like they can really see everything, which is good. And as they're getting a few more into WA, which is good. So that'll only help the support and the technical expertise. Uh, future for us. Uh, I see a big future in, in jobs like pest baiting and, and mice and snails. Uh, we have a big issue with, um, I'd love to be able to put a camera underneath the bot and actually map snails and mice per hectare and actually go variable rate baiting cells for a start and then build that into the system as we go along. Uh, I'd love to be able to also for a second round of N like moisture sense or, or go around and actually map soil water uh, right before spreading. So we, we have, have a lot of confidence in whereabouts we think it is and we're about to have a go with Aiden of hooking an AM onto it and doing six metre swaths and it only does 10 kilometres an hour so seeing whether that data at such intricate levels changes compared to the industry standard of a 36 metre swath line and our platform we've stayed with the haze boom and weed it so that any autonomous manufacturer as the tech's developing very quickly. So, well, I want to keep very open to making sure that whoever's got the best tractor or whoever's got the best implement, we can go on and, and bring it in. And I'm confident in our boundaries that we can uh, adopt that. So, and a quick run through of the savings. Uh, I've tried to be very honest with our numbers. And so every reco where we sprayed, I also made our agro give us a blanket spray um, just so I could compare the costs. Because if you just if we just did it based on what the weed it brew was, it worked out that we'd saved about 160 grand of chemicals. So you can you can fudge the numbers and make it look pretty good, but that was sort of as honest as we could get. Um and just sort of comparing um the the operational costs. Yeah, we sort of work on eight dollars a head there for our own boom spray to run across our paddocks. So being able to, uh, the $1.50 a hectare, that's sort of covering the fuel and stuff. And um, I'm going to attach a, a swarm lease cost per hectare, but I want to have it for a year and, and run it for a full year before I uh, try to attach a cost to that to see how many hectares we can get done. Um, but yeah, thanks for the opportunity of uh, letting me, talk here today in front of you all and um, also would like to just say thanks to my parents for giving me the opportunity to come home and get involved um, yeah I'm really enjoying it and it's been good so no, thanks thank you we've got time for one question um, but I'm assuming you'll stay around for dinner tonight yep. Yep. fantastic Yeah, yeah, we do. And um, really trying to, and, and also heat stress, like our southern end, we probably get our sea breeze in about two hours earlier than our northern end. So probably in a dry spring, wanting to see what effect that has moving forward. But since we've probably put it in, there's a few older yield maps that uh, we don't, we didn't think was frost, but now we're looking back going, lined up with when we've had frost damage and when the gauges have shown frost. So they're pretty similar zones. So we're probably realizing we've had a bit more frost in the past than what we uh, have. Yep. All right. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, appreciate that. Um, uh, our second to last speaker, um, shouldn't really require an introduction, but Frank Demden from Living Farms. Um, Frank's going to talk about applying PA tools in the WA viticulture space for premium wine growing. Frank's also the immediate past president of SPA. So yeah, really appreciate you coming up. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Dale. And thanks, uh, Brett, for the invitation to talk today. Um, 
Yeah, it's uh, and thanks everyone for uh, attending the conference as well. It's um, great to see so many numbers and great to see so many familiar faces. Um, and uh, look forward to catching up with you all for a beer tonight. Um, so I'll keep this as short as possible. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of you probably um, don't know that I've been involved with a bit with viticulture over the last uh, sort of 20 years. Um, I've been mainly working in Broadacre, so um, it's nice to add a bit of diversity to the um, range of presentations. So I'm just going to be looking at a couple of properties uh, that I've been working on recently. Uh, one's a bit of a work in progress, the other one I know um, a bit better. Um, so, but just to start from a, a, a wider perspective, um, looking at the uh, impact of the recent trade barrier um, that was put up by uh, China and the effect of that on uh, on the industry, uh, on the Australian wine industry. So, um, for the last sort of fifteen, um, oh, sorry, last uh, uh, six to eight years, as you can see there, the the um, wine trade to China has just grown massively from. Um, up to over a billion dollars um, and pretty much overnight um, dropped to nothing. Um, and uh, you uh, don't need to um, be an economist to understand the effect that that would have on uh, on prices. So uh, we've seen a, a um, very steady decline in um, bulk uh, uh, wine, uh, red wine trade uh, prices Um uh, international trade prices for Australian red wine because that was the main export to uh, to China. Um, so uh, what we're talking about here are, is a bulk wine exports, uh, and the, um, as you'd understand, uh, just going to the bottle shop, you'll see how um, diversified or um, the the wine market is. Um, with you know, you can buy. Five dollars a liter, or or five hundred dollars a a liter, or five thousand dollars a liter, if you if you want to go to the extremes, uh, for for wine. So it's a highly segregated market, um, and you can see that in the stats for uh, when you look at just cab savs, which is what I'll be concentrating on, um, for um, for the examples um, for Australia. If you look at the top left here, um, the um, the uh, vintage, the the Weybridge average Weybridge value for grape growers selling to wineries uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon as across Australia um, has has dropped from around uh, eight hundred and fifty bucks a ton uh, down to um, down to sort of seven hundred. But in in Southwest WA, we've bucked the trend and we're actually increasing and and uh, continuing to go up. And that's just a recognition of the quality of Cab Sav that's coming out of the out of the region. Um, and uh, but you know those these numbers are a bit older. Um, but uh, it, just to give you an idea of the international comparison uh, for for Cabernet Sauvignon um, prices, if you look at the Napa Valley. Um, you know their their average uh, weighted average price is eight thousand dollars US a ton, uh, and that's a US ton, not a metric ton. So those numbers are actually even even higher um, when you look at uh, these these numbers here for um, Australian dollars uh, per metric ton, um, up around two thousand dollars for for WA. So. Um, you know, obviously, we don't live next door to Silicon Valley, and we don't have, um, you know, one of the highest concentrations of high net worth individuals on our doorstep driving uh, up to Napa Valley every weekend. Um, but I tell you what, the quality of the wine um, that comes out of the southwest of WA in terms of cab savvy is on a par. It's just recognition and um, uh, and and economics. So. Um, so that gives you a bit of an idea of the of how segregated the uh, market is uh, from a from the global down to the the local perspective. Um, but then when you take it down to the next level uh, to the to the micro uh, site specific um, level, then uh, then you can see how important it is um, uh, for for production. So. Uh, this is a map, this is property, so this is Grace Farm, it's a um, small boutique winery um, 
uh, eight hectares in um, just out of Gracetown in the Margaret River region. Uh, been working on this for um, around 20 years now on the property. Um, it's because uh, it belongs to my in-laws. Um, so I've been forced into uh, doing various things down there. Um, but it's a labour of love. <laughs> That's like the boys before me, but know all about. <laughs> um, but uh, so, yeah, I'll give you a quick description of, of what these maps are all about. Um, so the Lewin Naturalist Ridge runs from um, uh, Boston, Dunsborough, down to Cape, uh, Cape, Nat, to Cape Lewin. Uh, and this property sits right on the ridge um, to the west um, side. Uh, you've got the peak of the ridge and exposed uh, granite. Uh, and then to the east, um, uh, so this um, the the water flows uh, from uh, west to east on this property. This uh, this spot here is a um, deep um, deep sandy uh, loamy sand, um, and there was a soak in the middle of this block um, when it was purchased. Um, was filled in and a uh, a drain put in down here to to run that water out of there because it just it was just getting waterlogged. Uh, and then you've got a waterway running down here. Um, so a lot of this, the, a lot of the water that um, uh, it falls here, and it actually runs into this off the off the exposed granite along the ridge here, um, down, and then also hits this um, high EM area here, and ends up with a bit of water logging in this corner. Uh, and then this block here is completely different again. Uh, so. Uh, this is highly mineralized granite. There would have been over 100 cubic meters of granite pulled out of this um, block when it was developed. Um, and uh, there's, so there are two, um, there's Cab Cabernet Sauvignon planted in this block here, uh, in this block here, um, and here and, and up the top here. But for this example, I'm just gonna look at this block here uh, and, and this one here as an example. Um, so that's the the EM map. So thankfully, everyone, thankfully, the previous presenters have been able to explain what EM is. So I can get away with that. Um, uh, and then, yeah. So if we move to the next slide, sorry. Um, so this is the radiometric storium, and in some respects, reflects uh, the the EM maps in that this um, being sandy is very low potassium, uh, very low potassium. Uh, this this area here that was never planted is um, that's a sandy a, like deep white sand. Uh, this was previously a, a cattle grazing property, um, and uh, so that just grows peppermints. And you can see the this um, this white sand extends into a, a heavier loamy clay soil down here. Um, and then this is a sand over gravel uh, soil up here. And then another very deep sandy um, soil type up here with gravel at depth down around 60 centimetres. Um, so the other aspect of this property is the, the Kawaramup Brook flows through it. Um, and this is a, a dam down the bottom here, Creek Line Dam. You see the very high potassium levels around here uh, and down here. And that's essentially down close to the valley floor where the um, eroded granites uh, pretty much end up. So um, clay, clay right to the surface uh, down there, um, and and this is uh, this is still very rocky, um, but it's gravelly um, to the surface, which the next thorium map will explain. So once again, um, having low EM, low potassium, and low thorium, then that's that's the real clue to that being a, a, a sandy soil, um, and same up here. Um, and uh, but this here, this area here is is very gravelly, um, highly mineralized, very high phosphorus retention, um, and very low yielding, but extremely high quality um, capsaicin comes off that block. Um, and so, what I've um, been uh, uh, trying um, lately is um, uh, the K-means clustering. So. Um, PCT have um, developed, uh, been, I think, working with the University of Sydney on a project. And this is, I think, Michael, is this true? One of the outputs of that project. <laughs> um, so, and it's a great tool for um, being able to um, bring multiple types of data together um, and cluster them in a way 
um, that can then go on to help make management decisions. So, um, so yeah, it, it really and it really does a great job in in zoning up the different um, areas of production uh, and reflects also the the initial uh, soil surveys um, that were done to inform the planting uh, for this property as well. So um, these areas were were chosen for cab sav because they were um, the um, had the, the highest mineralization. Um, it was uh, yeah a high quality site. Um, this area here was um, to totally planted to Cabernet, uh, to Sauvignon Blanc. Um, half of it ended up being pulled out and planted to Chardonnay, and this block here is is Chardonnay as well. Um, so that's um, and you can see how much the thorium drives the um, the high thorium area here drives the uh, the clustering, and that's a completely different um, kettle of fish in its own right. That that particular section there. So um, what we're um, just for the first time uh, this year, we're able to get uh, yield data off the um, off the contract harvester. So there haven't been any grape yield monitors in uh, the Margaret River region until this year. So everything. Um, so these are some of the first yield maps that we've seen out of the region. Um, and uh, we. So this is the. Um, sorry, if I just take a step back, this block we're looking at. Um, is is this particular one here? Um, so this has got a few issues. Uh, this block, it's oh, sorry, go forward one. Thank you. Um, so uh, probably would have done things a bit differently if we had these maps when it was first um, planted, but. Um, this high EM here, area three here, um, basically you can see it. It the um, it's very low yielding. Um, this this area down the bottom here is particularly noticeable when you're looking at the at the vines. So you can see they suffer from low vigor, and uh, in the um, towards the end of winter, it just becomes completely waterlogged. So the the grape. Uh, the vines never really established properly there. They've got, they just haven't got the root growth. They've probably had hypoxic environment in the subsoil. Um, but this area through here was actually a bit of a surprise um, and also a surprise on the yield map as well. We didn't expect to see such low, you know, we knew that there were a few spots in there that weren't so low yield, weren't as um, high yielding, but um, once we were able to overlay the two, we can really see what's going on there. Um, and uh, what we suspect is going on is the water that's um, going into the subsoil um, in from this block basically flows down this hill and hits this clay barrier and comes up and, and is stopping the, the um, vine roots from establishing, uh, establishing properly and causing low yield. So what we'll probably end up doing is putting a, a subsurface drain in. Thankfully, the, the elevation runs down um, towards this end, so we could should be able to get away with running a um, an ag drain down through one of these rows to to relieve this water. Um, so, if we look at this block here compared to this one down here, the value of the wine coming off um, this one is much higher, um, uh, and but the problem is this uh, this area here is well we can we can probably do something about this and grow a bit a few more grapes from here um, by relieving this water but there's nothing we can do about this so uh, essentially that's um, uh, that's but you know we're happy to have to leave this and probably feed it a bit more pea to get the yields up um, given it's high phosphorus retention um, but certainly um, it's naturally constrained just by the rock underneath it so if we move to the Franklin River, uh, I thought I was going to be able to save, help you with your time, uh, <laughs> but I'm not doing a very good job of that. Uh, but this is the last slide, of, last couple of slides. Um, so if we, this is a work in progress at the moment. Um, so uh, this is over in uh, Franklin River, so in the Great Southern Region. Um, we've, um, the uh, 
the maps here are a little bit dirtier. Um, not don't, haven't given the PCT uh, uh, finesse yet, but um, there. So this is the EM map on the left hand side here. The purples are the are the high EM, uh, and on the right hand side we've got a radiometric thorium map, and um, same again. Uh, low is the red, and 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 purples are the high. So this is the development area for this. Um, oh, this this block here is actually planted, but they're looking to re um, sort of mix things up a bit with what they're doing. Uh, and this whole area around here is is a development um, block, and they know that there's you know, a lot of soil variation there. But they did the survey to work out exactly what's going on and how to configure these vineyards. So these particular areas um, uh, where they've got high EM and low uh, uh, yeah, and low thorium is where they'll target plantings of uh, Vermentino and Fiano. So they're um, uh, Italian white rind varieties um, and they'll do particularly, they'll do better in that sort of soil type. Um, whereas uh, what they're doing really well with on, uh, on this property uh, is with bush vine Grenache um, and, um, and Gamay as well is one thing they're going to try. Um, but this is uh, a deep forest gravel here, so lateritic gravel, um, uh, very difficult to manage water on, but uh, will grow great um, greds based on the experience from other similar soil types. So it basically means that they can really target their plantings to these particular areas for the, uh, for the best outcomes. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Two minutes, two minutes to go. Oh, great. There you go. <laughs> so... Thanks, Frank. Um, one question for Frank before we move on to the last presentation. So, Frank, just on that last part, then. Yep. So, the 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 planting. So, yep. Will they really follow that detailed pattern? Oh, uh, look, they'll as best they can. Obviously, there's constraints within, um, you know, uh, row lengths and that sort of thing for to make it economic. Um, but they'll follow it as closely as they can. Yeah, yep. And they've actually used uh, on another part of the vineyard. They, um, the 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 soil types were so different. They ended up um, cutting the through the middle of a bunch of rows, putting in new headlands, um, so that they could split the watering from one to the other because they were just so different. And they were overwatering one and underwatering the other. So um, they are using this data to to reconfigure vineyards as well. Yep. And, and just fine. What, why is it taking so long to get the yield monitor down here? Is, is this, was this the Australian guys one? That got uh, no, it's a Polonc one. Polonc. So, yeah, yeah. So, it's French one. So, yeah. Yep. So, no, that, the Australian guys only got that operating in South Australia, I think. Oh, well, in the essence, that's... Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, no, I'm not sure why it's taking so long for WA. It's, 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 uh, I forgot to point out the volumes. Uh, you were talking about much smaller volumes in the in the WA industry than, than over East. So, yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right. Thanks very much, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Julia Easton uh, is a senior research fellow with the Curtin University. She's going to talk about uh, the introduction to tomorrow's industry roundtable uh, and is plug and play a pipe dream. As Julia is coming up, just wanted to let you know on your tables is a QR code which is the evaluation for today. So um, days like this, we want your, your feedback, good and bad, so that we can make every event as good as it possibly can be. So just a reminder, the QR code's there, if you could please uh, give us your honest feedback. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. I'm sure how to drive this thing. There we go. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. And I recognise it's really hard to be the last speaker and be in between you guys and a beer. So I promise I'll be really quick. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Bindi with her deep herd hat on today. Um, and in a nutshell, we'd really love to have your input into the round table tomorrow. So this has come about because um, I've had a project which is called the Digital Edge. It's about um, developing an industry report on something in the data space uh, it's about doing some training and masterclasses and it's about working with growers and their agronomists to develop research capability uh, in the precision ag space and agribusiness analytics. Um, so when Bindi and I got together, 
got together and said, what are we going to talk about at this uh, at this symposium because VRT workshops have all happened. Where's the gap? Where's the opportunity? And Bindi said, this is her vision statement. Imagine if there was just one software program to do everything. And we may have already had a little bit of a pitch around that today, um, but I think that there's still a little bit more that we can do. Um, Bindi wants uh, to be able to drive machines, collect my data, analyse my data, make a decision and get it back into the machine and apply it in the paddock and then repeat. Uh, I think we've heard a bit of that from plenty of people today. And if we can't have this, what can we do to make it efficient and reliable so that um, we can use the technology to the full potential? This is the um, precision decision making, right? And how do we overcome some of these barriers to adoption and technology to simplify the process for growers? Right, there's never been a better time. I don't need to pitch this slide. It's been the whole day, right? Um, we're going to hear from Roger tomorrow about some of the work that he's done with the Liby Group around uh, growers having using more than seven different techs, tech or apps. Um, and 90% of them state that interoperability is a challenge. And these are for farmers who are using lots of data already. So what does that mean for those that are not using it? Um, input cost and grain price volatility are driving the value of value proposition for precision ag. And when we start looking down the barrel of accountability and the pathway to net zero, what does that mean for data collection and how do we utilize that to the benefit of the industry? Um, and, you know, no surprises here that growers have access to more data and technology than ever before, but what do they do with all that data? So there's a little bit of detail around the ISO bus details. I'm not going to go into it now. It's too late in the day, but you either know it or you don't, and it's on the web if you want to look up some more about it. Um, we've done a little bit of a preliminary summary. So some of that's the industry challenge that I've put up there. Um, then some questions about data in and data out issues, reliability issues, communication issues. So just take a minute to have a look up there. I don't know if you can read it in the back, but to think about it from your perspective, what's missing? Do you agree with what's up here? What have we forgotten? Um, and really keen to talk to everybody about that tomorrow. So we're going to start with a half hour panel session where we're going to hear from Phil Honey, from Andrew Sargent, from Jack McHugh and from Matt Stewart. So we're looking for advisors, farmers, um, and Andrew's been talking about open source as part of his Nuffield scholarship, um, and to hear from the software developers and from the machinery people um, from their perspective. We've got a series of questions to ask them. And then we're going to break out into um, a session where we're going to look at these particular questions around uh, and unpack them. So what are where are we? What are the problems and where do we need to get to? And hopefully what we'd like to do is to develop a roadmap to interoperability. I'm going to flick through this because it's too many words. Um, and that's it. So um, I hope that I've managed to convince you to hang around a little bit longer. Uh, there is a bar tab at the end if that helps. Um, so, <laughs> And if you'd like to come and ask me any questions about it or if you can't make it and you want to give me some feedback, I'll be really grateful to get it this afternoon. Tomorrow you can find me on Twitter or by email or whatever. So thanks so much. Thanks, Julia. Um, that was our last presentation this afternoon. So thanks to Julia. Um, Really want to thank all the speakers for this afternoon. Um, really, especially uh, our two farmer presenters, I think actually seeing that practical adoption of what happens in Precision Ag uh, is really exciting to see. So thank you, both of you. Um, so we are going to move into the Sundowner drinks present drink session, which is out where you've been having morning tea and lunch because we're going to re tidy up the room um, for dinner tonight. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Can you again fill in your evaluation of the day? Then we'll move across into the drink session um, and we'll be back in here for dinner for those people who are staying on for dinner. So thanks very much.